All right, we're continuing our series through the book of Acts. So we're up to Acts 18 and just been going through verse by verse, kind of looking at different points. And as I kind of like to do is look at some of the things that aren't necessary on the surface and just look at maybe things a little deeper. Some Also to look at it from placing yourself in the story rather than just reading through a scripture or historical uh, account and begin to feel the different emotions or what they were feeling like and what was going on with them if you were there. And so uh, we're going to start with chapter 18. And, and as we start in 18, I want to first make a comparison between 17, the end of 17, where Paul is at Athens, and then the way he approaches as he goes to Corinth and his uh, different method, you might say, of how he presents it. Because in the end of chapter 17, if you still have your Bibles there, he remember that Athens was the, the center of philosophy, you know, all the different philosophies, the Stoics, the Plato, the uh, Epicureans, all the different ones, and they would get, and they would argue kind of their point and what they thought was great. And in in uh, First Corinthians uh, chapter nine, Paul makes a statement. He says, "You know, to the Jew, I became like a Jew. To those under law, I became like one under the law. To those without the law, I became as one out of the law, that I might win some." to Christ. So I think as he's approaching his ministry there at the end of the chapter 17, with the Athenians, he's, he's approaching it more from a, a philosophy, because it's interesting in his little speech he gives there, it's great, but he doesn't mention the name of Jesus. And so it, to me, it's almost like he's trying to relate to them you know, on that label, on that level. While as he goes to Corinth, if you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I want to show you what he says as he writes the letter to the Corinthians. He's also telling how he came to them and the difference, I think, in his approach. And also, as you look at the end of, of uh, 17, there were a few people, you know, he names at the end, a few men became followers. We don't have any written, you know, letter to a church at Athens. We don't have it mentioned again. And so we don't seem to have one where he's actually established a church there. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, so this is the different approach. He says, when I came to you, brothers, again, this is to the Corinthians, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I pro proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching was not with wise and persuasive words, but with demonstrations of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So I see a, a difference in an approach between the Athenian and, again, here in Corinth. And if you go back to chapter 1, like verse 18, he says, for the, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it, it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, and I will frustrate. So to me, he comes on a, on a different level. And I think the difference in results 
being that the, the Corinthian church became a pretty powerful church, had a lot of problems, but it was established and grew and flourished. So let's go back to chapter 18. We'll start with verse 1, and we'll just kind of go, for the most part, verse by verse. So verse 1, after this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. Now, Corinth was 46 miles from Athens, and it was a, a Roman city uh, under Roman rule and under Roman law. It was a major trading port, uh, trade center, so a very influential city. Verse 2, there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. And Paul went to see them because he was a tent maker as they were. Let me stop there. So Emperor Claudius, uh, well, let me go back to, uh, we know what time uh, the Jews were expelled from Rome. And Claudius had expelled the Jews because they were uh, a lot of dissension. There was a lot, even riots going on because of the Christian message. And so Claudius basically got tired of it and said, just remove all the Jews, get out of Rome. He was tired of messing with it. And that was in A.D. 49. So we can pinpoint exactly when uh, Paul was in Corinth. And again, it was because of the Christian message and the disturbance between the Jews and those who were Christians. So anyway, Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and he worked with them. So Aquila and Priscilla were, were tent makers, and so was Paul. That was his, his trade. And so he worked with his hands to provide for himself, and that's why a lot of times in the, his different letters to the different churches, he was saying, you know, he will... Uh, make sure that people are not idle. Says you need to, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. You need to work with your hands and provide for yourself. And so he's always encouraging uh, the people to work, to have a trade, to have uh, something to contribute. Now, verse four. Said every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now, the Greeks would have been what the Jews would have referred to as God-fearers. In other words, they would attend uh, the synagogue, but they hadn't completely converted to Judaism. But he went every Sabbath because the other six days he was working. That was his normal plan. He would work, provide for his own needs, and then he would minister to now, verse 5, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. So when Silas and Timothy come, they're bringing support from Thessalonica, from Philippi, from the different places they'd been in northern Greece, and they were helped supporting Paul so that he was able then to start ministering full time. And so the churches in northern Greece were helped supporting Paul in his ministry and his mission activity. So verse 6, But when the Jews opposed Paul... And became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own head. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he shook out his garments. Okay, so that would be similar to 
uh, back in Matthew chapter 10 where, where Jesus is uh, giving instructions to the 12 disciples about ready to go out. And he says, if you go out and, you know, people reject your message, shake the dust off your feet, meaning just showing that you have done your part, they have rejected it, and their judgment, as Ezekiel would say, meaning the blood, the judgment would be upon themselves. You had did your part. But that also brings a, a kind of um, application for us today. For all of us to think about, at what point do you stop witnessing to someone? Because I think there are times where, like, if you are, uh, in this case, like with Paul, they begin to abuse him, they begin to argue. Say you're trying to witness to someone, and all they do is want to argue, or all they want to do is, uh, you know, call you names or, or, you know, fight against what you're trying to do. There comes a point where you have to do the same, where you have to shake the dust off your feet, where you do not want to cast your, your pearls before swine. And so you have to be led by the Spirit to know when that is. That doesn't mean you quit praying for them, but there comes a time where you know they're not going to receive, and maybe you just sown seeds and someone else is going to reap. But there does come a point sometimes when you have to say, okay, you know, I'm done. All right, verse 7. So then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. Now, this Titus is not the same uh, Titus that we have the book of Titus or that was Paul's helper. This is a, a, a different per person. But it's funny that... Uh, He goes, very, he goes next door to the synagogue. It probably didn't win him a lot of friends, if you think about it. So I'm going to a different place, but I'm going to go right next to the synagogue where I've just been rejected, and he begins to minister there. Probably didn't make them real happy. Crispus, the synagogue ruler... And his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard him believed, and they were baptized. So many are getting baptized. He's having success again with the power of the Holy Spirit during the convicting. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So if you think about this, usually by this time, Paul's been run out of a city. You know, so often he has uh, so much backlash, and for his own safety sometimes, you know, he's been, he's been uh, beaten, he's been stoned, supposedly to death. And so many times he's not able to stay in a city very long. But in this case, the Lord comes and encourages him and in, the, in fact, he says that he's going to be able, he spends 18 months in Corinth, which is the longest he spent anywhere except for Ephesus, which is going to be the next, next chapter, which we talk about where he was there for actually three years ministering in the city of Ephesus. But I think we also have to realize that, that Paul needed encouragement. Because his life was not easy. Again, he, he ran up against a lot of rejection, a lot of physical harm to him personally. And sometimes we think of these guys as supernatural beings. 
But they got fearful, they got anxious, they got discouraged. And so the Lord would appear, and it wasn't like he was having a vision every other day, but at key times the Lord would appear to him, and in this case encourage him and say, no, stay here, you know, no one's going to attack you, I have a lot of people here, you're going to have fruitful ministry. And he needed to hear that. He needed that encouragement to keep on going. And if you think about the different visions he had, you know, of course, you know, on the road to Damascus, when his salvation, uh, when he first goes to Jerusalem, and, you know, he's in the temple, and the Lord appears to him and says, get out of town, because they're not accept your message. And he kind of wants to argue with the Lord. Yeah, but Lord, they know that I used to persecute Christians, you know. He said, no, get out of town. Other times when he was... Uh, shipwreck, you know, later when the Lord appears to him and, and tells him that, you know, the ship's going to be lost, the pro- you know, all the property's going to be lost, but I'm giving you the lives of those who are on board. Uh, so different times the Lord would appear to him and give him encouragement, and this is the time where he actually took him to heaven, and he got to see things in heaven, and he says that, that it's inexpressible. I can't even talk about the things that I saw. So he had different key times in his life where he had a vision. But it's not like every other day he was having a vision. But times when the Lord needed to meet him. And sometimes for us, it's the same way. If you have an outstanding vision, all of a sudden the Lord gives you something, it may mean that you're going to need that. Because of the opposition you're going to come against. All right, so now we're in verse 12. Well, Galileo was pro council of Achia. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him to court. Now, we know that he was, Galileo was served as pro council from 51 AD to 52 AD. So, again, we, we can pinpoint the time that Paul was in Corinth because of, of the records they have of when he was made pro council. So let's take verse 13 through 17. So they, they bring him before the pro council, and they say, this man, they charge, is persuading the people to worship God in a way contrary to the law. Now, the law they're talking about is the Jewish law, the Torah. Now, just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo said to the Jews, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourself. I will not be a judge of such thing. So he had them ejected from the court, and they all turned to Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him from the court, in front of the court. But Galilee showed no concern whatsoever. So, Paul was not transgressing any Roman law. There was nothing wrong with him uh, preaching the gospel. And so, as a Roman and as a proconsul, he said, you know, it's kind of like Claudius did in Rome. You know, I don't put up with this stuff. This, you know, he hasn't broken a crime. And that's where being a Roman citizen, oh, you know, tended to help Paul, but also being under Roman law, actually, was a benefit in this case. The Sosthenes, who it says they beat before uh, the synagogue, now he was, it says, the synagogue ruler. We have a Sosthenes in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, and we don't know for sure it's the same one. But Paul's writing the letter to the Corinthians, and he says it's from from 
from Paul and from Sophonies. It could be, especially since the fact that he was in Corinth, that somewhere he got converted and became a follower with Paul and actually traveled with him. But we can't really prove whether it is the same Sophonies or this is a different, a different one. All right, verse 18. It says, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. And then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Stop there just for a second. Normally, with a married couple, you would always mention the male before the female. But you'll find as you go through this, you see that her name many times is named first. So a lot of scholars think that she might have been uh, maybe the most gifted or maybe the most anointed one of the couple because it's just unusual for Paul and for the, the Luke who's writing this to list her first. Just something to consider. So he was accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila, and before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Sincera because a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue, and he reasoned with the Jews, and when they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But he left, but as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is, the God, if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. And when he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went into Antioch. So, kind of going back to, to 18. So, Sincera was six point six and a half miles from Corinth, and it was the major port uh, for Corinth to the Aegean Sea. So that's why it was important. But the other part is Paul gets a haircut. So what's so big about Paul getting his haircut? He had a great barber, what, you know, what's going on? But it said he'd taken a vow, so almost all scholars believe that it was the Nazarite vow, and so, let's go and look at that in Numbers chapter 6, so you know what he's, what he's kind of talking about. So, back to the Torah, Numbers chapter 6. And it's a, a little long passage, but let's go ahead and, and look through it, just so you have an idea of what's happening here. And this is... Moses, he said, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man or a woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of separation to the Lord as a Nazarite, he must abstain from wine and other fermented drinks. He must not drink vinegar made from wine or from any fermented drinks. He must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as he is a Nazarite, he must not eat any of these things that come from the grapevine, not even the seed or the skin. Now, during the entire period of the vow of separation, no razor may be used on his head. He must be holy until the period of his separation to the Lord is over. He must let his, the hair of his head grow long throughout the period of his separation to the Lord. He must not go near a dead body, even if his own father or mother or brother or sister dies, he must not make himself ceremonially unclean on account of them, because a symbol of separation to God is on his head. 
Therefore, the period of separation is consecrated to the Lord. Now, if someone dies suddenly in his presence, thus defiling the hair he had dedicated, he must shave his head on that day of cleansing, the seventh day. Then on the eighth day, he must bring two doves or two young pigeons to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The priest is to offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering and make atonement for him because he sinned by being in the presence of a dead body. That same day he is to consecrate his head. He must dedicate himself to the Lord for his period of a separation and must bring a year-old lamb as a guilt offering the previous day and does not count because he became defiled during the separation. Now, this is the law for the Nazarite. When the period of the separation is over, he is brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting. There he is to present his offering to the Lord, a year-old male lamb without defect for a burnt offering, a year-old ewe lamb without a defect for a sin offering, a ram without a defect for a fellowship offering. Together with their grain offering, they drink offerings, and a basket of bread made without yeast, case made of fine flour mixed with oil, water spread with oil. The priest is to present it before the Lord and make the sin offering for the burnt offering. He is to present the basket of an unleavened bread and sacrifice the ram as a fellowship offering to the Lord together with his grain offering and drink. And if you read through the, through the rest, I won't go through the uh, rest down to verse 21, because it, it changed. That was the original Nazarite vow. Of course, that one was the tent of meeting, and they're all in one place. Obviously, now history has changed, and they're spread all over. You have the synagogue uh, system set up so that they don't have to go uh, to the temple in Jerusalem to do this. They can do it wherever they're at. And obviously it takes difference now, but the point was that you make a, a, a sacrifice. You're making a vow to the Lord not to cut your hair, not to, eat, not to drink these things as a way of separating for a specific time. And it doesn't say what the specific time is. That was, would be up to you. Maybe up, be considerable to uh, us, you know, maybe fasting. You're taking you know, a, a day or a week to fast. And so it's a time of separation. And so it had evolved, you might say, in a way from the original Nazarite vow, but it was still being practiced a lot by Jewish believers. Now, there's another one I want you to look at back in Acts. Because in Acts chapter 21, we're going to run into this again. So if you turn over to Acts 21, and we're going to start in verse 20. So this is when uh, Paul has gone to Jerusalem after he, uh, he meets them and in verse 20, it says, when they heard this, because he's, he's given a report of all his work among the Gentiles and all those coming in, and they're, you know, they're celebrating that, and, and the great harvest is coming in. But then in verse 20, it says, now when they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are jealous and zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to the customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men Join in their per purification rites and pay their expenses so they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth 
in these remarks about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. Again, back to chapter 15. Now the next day, Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. And then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. So again, he's, he's, as he's gone to Jerusalem, people, you, you have this constant attack upon Paul because in Romans, he has to defend himself several different times where he, he says, well, if it's by grace, then let's just sin more so there's more grace because he's kind of accused of maybe sloppy grace, we would say. And he would refute that and say, no, how can you who have died to sin live in sin? And so he's refuting that different times throughout his ministry. But that was a charge that was constantly coming about Paul. And also, well, you know where it says, let me go back to 18 seconds because I want to. Where it says he went to Caesarea, which is, you know, the port city, beautiful city there, right on the Mediterranean. And then he says he goes up to the church to greet the church. Okay, when you're going to Jerusalem, doesn't matter whether you're going from the north, the south, the east, or the west, you're going up because that's the way it was always said in the Old Testament. It's, and it was a little bit of elevation, but it's not because of the elevation, it's because this was the city of the great king. So you went up regardless of elevation. So he went to the church at Jerusalem. Now it seems, and you know, I looked up several different scholars on this, there seems to be tension between Paul and the church in Antioch and the church in Jerusalem. So the church in Jerusalem is made up almost entirely of Jews. Church of Antioch is made up more of Gentiles than Jews. The emphasis of Paul ministry and the church of Antioch was grace by faith, you are saved. Now, the church in Jerusalem was more about living holy lives. So, which was right? Well, they're, they're, they're both right. One had a, a stronger emphasis on one part. Antioch had a different emphasis with grace because you think of, you know, who's the head of the, the church in Jerusalem? James, or really in Hebrew, Jacob, the head of the church, half-brother Jesus, and he writes the book of James. Okay, what does he say in James? You know, faith without works is worthless. You know, I'll show you my faith by what I do, by my actions, okay? And so some people throughout history, like Martin Luther, uh, didn't like the book of James. He thought it shouldn't be in the Bible because it, it seemed to downplay grace saved by faith. But it's not one or the other. It's both. It's that whole thing. You know, on, on that road, there's a ditch on both sides. You can get either in legalism or you could get into licentiousness on the other side. And so it, it's a highway of holiness that we're, we're to walk. So there was a tension, again, between uh, Paul and the church in Jerusalem to some what degree. And some of the charges were really not true, but that's how they looked at it. That's how they looked at Paul, like you're overemphasizing faith saved by grace. And he would constantly have to defend himself. They know that's not what I'm saying. 
And so both are right. But he never spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. His visits were kind of quick, so he went to Jerusalem, met with them, and then he go back to Antioch. So let's pick up, where were we? 40, yeah, 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia, Hariga, strengthening all the disciples. So again, Antioch was, his, was the mother church that sent them out originally. They were the ones who supported them also financially, sent out him Barnabas and Saul, and then sent out uh, Silas and Mark, who went with him. And so he goes back through these, this area that he's already been, checking on the churches, seeing how things are going, I'm sure bringing some correction, you know, uh, encouraging them, trying to build them up. So it wasn't like he just would go to a, a city and establish a church and then never visit again. He, he was going back, encouraging, building up the churches. And of course, not to mention the letters we have where he wrote letters to them, the ones that have survived. Also strengthening, dealing with uh, different issues that come up in the church, uh, trying to bring correction. So in verse 24, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexander, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scripture. Okay, so Alexandria was the intellectual uh, hub of Egypt. It had the world-famous library. It's where uh, later we have St. Augustine. i uh, done a lot of his study there because this, it was uh, all the ancient texts were in that library. Uh, so he comes. He's a very intellectual, scholar-type guy. And it says, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and talked about Jesus accurately, although he knew only the baptism of John. So we don't really know what uh, Apollos was deficient in. There's something, you know, whether it was baptism in the name of Jesus, whether it was baptism with the Holy Spirit, we don't really know, but there was something, a, a missing part that he didn't have. So in verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him into their home and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So it's interesting. So they take him into home. They don't do this publicly. Okay, they, they take him privately, which is important, to correct him in, in whatever this missing part was that he didn't have and not trying to do it publicly. And it also shows that that Apollos was teachable. Here he was a scholar, well learned. And who are these this couple, tent makers, telling me what I'm missing? But he was very teachable. And we all need to be teachable. We all need to be, you know, there's things that 30, 40 years ago that I believed or doctrines that I thought have changed. And I think as we grow and we mature in the Lord, we need to be teachable, always learning, always looking, you know, seeing what others say, evaluating that, being Bereans, you know, are these things true? And again, Priscilla is mentioned first in that, that little section. Okay, verse 27. Now, when Apollos wanted to go to Chia, the brothers encouraged him 
and rode to the disciples there to welcome him. On arriving, he was great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scripture that Jesus was the Christ. So the church benefited greatly from the ministry of Apollos. Now, later we're going to find out that this kind of creates an issue within the church because as you look at the first letter to the Corinthian church, Paul has to address them and say, some are saying, I'm of Apollos. Some are saying, I'm of Paul. Some are saying, I'm of Jesus. And he has to rebuke them and say, hey, this isn't about elevating someone. This is about Jesus. And unfortunately, here we are today, 2004, and the church still hasn't necessarily learned that lesson. As we see people being elevated, celebrities, and then when they fall, is great destruction in the church. There are people who end up leaving, leaving even the faith, because we have a tendency to elevate someone, and it's great to have, a, you know, appreciate their ministry, appreciate their, their knowledge, understanding, but you have to be very careful that we don't get to the place where we are doing that, elevating people up, and that we keep the focus upon Jesus and not upon people, not about celebrities, not about, uh, because even if they don't fall into sin, it eventually does damage to the body of Christ. And that's one reason why here we like to have a team ministry where we have Nathan be sharing next week on Acts 19, and we will rotate. We have a team ministry believing that that's the way more of a New Testament form. Then you don't have to worry about that issue. Not, from, not that Nathan and I would awe you anyway, but it's just a good protective way because that does become an issue. And like with Paul, he says, you know, you guys, I'm of Apollos. I like that guy. I, I, I like Paul. He said, no, it's not about that. It's about Jesus. It's about him being lifted up and that we are just servants. So again, I just want to encourage you guys as, as we work through Acts, it gives us a picture of what was happening in the early church. And some of those issues still go on today. But we need to encourage each other. We need to continue to try to stay faithful. And, you know, as I said, we're trying to do the best we can to mimic or to be a New Testament example. And at the same time I say that, every church says that, every denomination. You know, and as we go back to that issue between Jerusalem church and the Antioch church, it's like today with different denominations. Different denominations doesn't mean they're necessarily wrong. It just means that their emphasis is different than this other denomination. And somewhere in there is the truth. And so we have to be very careful, you know, that we're not, well, this is the way, this is the only way, and the way we do things is the only right way. Because that, that does not you know, this does not help. So anyway, book of Acts has so much in there. His word is true. His word is what changes people. And going back to the very beginning when it says, you know, it's, it's by the Lord. You know, only the Lord can unlock the heart. So as you witness to others, as you, uh, you have to realize that it's only the Holy Spirit that can open that heart. We have a, part in it. We have a part to play. We have a part to sow seeds. We have a part to witness. But only him 
It's only the Lord that can open that heart. So I encourage you, sometimes you're going to face rejection, and sometimes you're going to have to just walk away. You continue to pray, continue to ask for those openings, but sometimes people are just going to reject you, and you've got to be okay with that because they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting actually Jesus. It's interesting that uh, James said, I was going to read that scripture actually early out of James chapter, or uh, November. Numbers, I'll get it right here, Numbers chapter 6. At the end of that is that, and I'm just going to read it over you guys again. And it says, Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. That's an awesome scripture, awesome blessing for each of us to receive. I'm going to end with a word of prayer. And anyone who would like to come up again to receive prayer for whatever the need may be, feel free to do that afterward. Those of you who need to go, you can go ahead and go. So let's end with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you. Again, for your word, we thank you, Lord, for testimonies of your goodness, of your kindness, of your faithfulness to us, Lord. And Lord, as we, uh, as we go through this book of Acts, as we, again, want to try and model ourselves after what the church looked like, Lord. Lord, as we want to offer ourselves as individuals, Lord, before you, we want to have clean hands and a pure heart. Lord, we want to be that pure, spotless bride. Lord, we want our minds renewed by the washing of your word. Lord, we ask, Lord, for that increase of your presence in our life. That we would be as John the Baptist who said, I must decrease and he must increase. Lord, we want to have you as our magnificent obsession. Lord, we ask that you would help us, Lord, with those besetting sins are those encumbrances that keep us back from entering into all that you have for us, Lord. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We praise you. For you alone are worthy. We give you this day. We give you our lives. And we give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.